Without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, introdu introduce Dr. Joseph Jankovic, who traveled here from Houston to talk to us about uh, blepharospasm, mesh, apraxia of eyelid opening, and other facial dystonias. You know, Dr. Jankovic uh, is a thrill for me to meet him uh, last night at dinner. He uh, is an internationally regarded expert in uh, movement disorders. Uh, he has uh, published, uh, excuse me, uh, published uh, hundreds of uh, publications in uh, major journals. He's involved with uh, many important uh, clinical trials uh, in uh, movement disorders, and he's in currently the endowed Baylor College of Medicine Distinguished Chair uh, <coughs> in uh, Movement Disorders. Um, and he is a former a chair of the Medical Advisory Board for the Benign Essential Blepharospasm Research Foundation and currently serves on the board. So thank you for making the trip. Well, thank you, Dr. Sekila, for the generous uh, introduction and for inviting me to participate in this uh, uh, symposium. Uh, uh, I've participated in dozens of these symposia, and it's always a pleasure to uh, interact uh, with my patients and other patients with uh, blepharospasm. I think this is the first symposium that has been hosted by a neurosurgeon. Uh, so congratulations, Dr. Sekula, you uh, made history uh, by uh, being the first neurosurgeon to host uh, the Blepharospasm uh, Research Foundation uh, Symposium. Um, it's wonderful to see uh, uh, a lot of people that I know, uh, including some of my patients all the way from uh, Houston and some patients that I'm seeing in Houston from, from other parts of the world. And uh, so again, uh, welcome. Uh, what I hope to do over the next uh, half an hour is to really sort of provide an introduction about uh, what blepharospasm is all about, uh, how it uh, is different from other conditions that are often confused with, with blepharospasm. Uh, the topic that is listed in your, um, in your handout is a long topic, and uh, there are like five topics that I was asked to cover in half an hour. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover all of it. Uh, and I'm going to tell you uh, reasons why I may not be uh, able to cover uh, all of the, the topics. So let me just start with some introductions uh, about the history of blepharospasm. Uh, so uh, one of the first individuals who probably described uh, blepharospasm in a scientific literature is uh, Professor Horatio Wood, uh, who was a neurologist in Philadelphia. Uh, and in 1887, uh, he uh, described the condition as follows. The facial convulsions are, in some cases, limited to isolated muscles, the orbicularis palpebrum. That's the mu main muscle that is contracting the eyelids, uh, especially prone to suffer giving rise to the infection known as blepharospasm. So he was one of the first people to actually use the term uh, blepharospasm. He didn't get it all right. He said the contraction is stunning, causing complete closure of the eye and consequent blindness. That's certainly true. This is accompanied by innumerable bizarre grimaces due to the efforts of the antagonistic muscles to overcome the force which is closing the lids. And this is, I think, where he was wrong. Uh, the muscle uh, contractions that are seen in uh, face, facial muscles other than the eyelids uh, that many patients have uh, is not probably due to the effort uh, of the, on the part of the patient to open the eyes, but these are actually part of the contractions that involve the eyes as well as other uh, facial muscles. And uh, as I uh, will explain to you later, uh, this is part of a condition called dystonia. Now, many of you heard uh, the term May syndrome, and in fact, in uh, the topic that I was asked to discuss, uh, it's listed as one of the topics I should uh, cover. Uh, so this is f named after a French neurologist who in 1910 described uh, m almost all just women uh, who had blepharospasm and mouth uh, and jaw tongue spasms. And it could have been due to a variety of reasons. It could have, uh, may not be just uh, due to uh, blepharospasm the way we know it. So clearly Henry Meish was not 
the first person to describe um, uh, the condition. He certainly didn't have it himself, so to say in a possessive form, Mages syndrome, that's not correct because he didn't have it. Um, and uh, uh, he clearly uh, had, uh, there were other reasons that I don't want to go into why he, I don't think he should be credited for describing uh, this, this condition. And this is one of the reasons why we really prefer not to use the term Mage syndrome um, and use the term cranial cervical dystonia. Now, uh, cranial cer cervical dystonia refers to uh, um, uh, a condition called dystonia, and blephor spasm is just one form of uh, dystonia. And dystonia can be described as a neurologic disorder dominated by involuntary, sustained, or spasmodic uh, repetitive and pattern contractions of muscles. The word patterned means that the same groups of muscles are involved. So in other words, we don't see a patient, let's say, with blephor spasm coming in like this with eyes closed, and the next, next time having eyes wide open, not being able to close their eyes. It just doesn't happen. Although occasionally some patients do have um, uh, eye opening, but that may be for another reason. Uh, uh, and I'll give you examples of uh, different spasms uh, that can occur in upper part as well as the low part of the face. But um, the point I'm really uh, trying to emphasize is that blepharospasm, the involuntary closure of the eyes, uh, is really a form of uh, a neurological condition called dystonia. Uh, so it's a focal dystonia. Uh, it has been wrongly referred to as benign essential blepharospasm, and the name of this, uh, of this organization, as you know, is the Benign Essential Blepharospasm Research Foundation. And I always had trouble with that name, and uh, uh, I had frequent discussions with Madeleine Gaster, the founder of the organization, about this, because many of you, uh, in fact, most of you probably will agree with, with me that your condition is not benign. Uh, it is not essential. You can live without it, right? Uh, and and, and uh, so, so the whole term of benign essential blepharospasm is not something that I endorse. Uh, and that's why I just call it blepharospasm, but I don't call it benign essential blepharospasm. We talked about the reasons why I don't like the term Mage syndrome. Uh, it really should be abandoned for a number of reasons besides what I mentioned. Uh, besides medical reasons, there are lots of ethical reasons why we should not be using the term Mage syndrome. And then uh, the, the other term that you read in the literature is called Bruegel syndrome. And this is based on uh, the description by uh, David Marsden, uh, who uh, actually is a, was a very close friend of mine and a close friend of Dr. Hallett, uh, who will be speaking later, um, who described this uh, condition called Bruegel syndrome based on the 16th century uh, painting by Flemish artist uh, named uh, Pierre Bruegel, who uh, painted this woman uh, that you see here on, on the slide uh, that may possibly have some eye, eyelid closure. Uh, she's probably compensating for it by uh, contracting her uh, frontalis muscle, the muscle of the forehead. And then she has this jaw opening, which could be, a, you know, she's bored and is yawning. Or uh, she may actually have dystonia of the jaw, uh, which is not all that uncommon in patients with blepharospasm. Uh, they often have a combination of uh, blepharospasm involving the eyes uh, and eyelids, as well as uh, other facial muscles, including the jaw muscles, uh, causing jaw closure or jaw opening. Uh, so we don't know anything about this individual, so we don't even know whether she actually had cranial dystonia. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, dystonia, because that is the, the general neurologic category of diseases under which we classify blepharospasm. This is taken from a, a consensus uh, paper that uh, many of us contributed to, including Dr. Hallett and myself, uh, trying to uh, come together and uh, provide a definition of dystonia and, and describe the, the phenomenology of dystonia. So uh, in this uh, uh, paper, which was just published about a year ago, uh, we defined dystonia as a movement disorder characterized by sustained or intermittent involuntary muscle activity, which leads to abnormal postures, movements, or both. Dystonic postures and movements are typically patterned. We talked about the fact that pattern means the same group of muscles, repetitive, and may be tremulous. And in fact, a lot of patients with dystonia, in addition to the sustained contraction of muscles in the face or other parts of the body, also have tremor. So for example, patients with uh, dystonia of the neck, which we call cervical dystonia, may have this kind of head tremor. Uh, we call it dystonic tremor. Or they may have tremor in their hands. In fact, 25% of patients with blepharospasm 
Council and Cervical Estonia have tremor in their hands. Many of you probably have noticed that you have tremor in your hands and uh, there is a discussion among the experts uh, what is the nature of that tremor that uh, patients with blepharospasm or cervical estonia have in their hands. Uh, some of us think that this is uh, uh, due to a coexistence with another condition called essential tremor, which is again a wrong term, essential, uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, that's the term that is used for this condition called essential tremor. Uh, so there are different reasons why patients with dystonia also shake. Um, these uh, movements are initiated or worsened by voluntary movement and may overflow from initially affected side to adjacent or other parts. So sometimes a patient with dystonia, let's say of the hand, with dystonic rider scan, may also develop dystonia of the arm. It can spread to the shoulder and, and the neck. Uh, we call it an overflow uh, ph phenomena. Now, not every uh, patient with dystonia have, has abnormal posture. Uh, we use the um, example of cervical dystonia, to, you know, with turning of the head or torticollis to the uh, head, uh, to, uh, torticollis uh, to one side. Uh, but patients with blood spasm have, don't have abnormal posture, they just have abnormal contraction of muscles that uh, causes the squeezing type movement. Another example are patients who have laryngeal dystonia, uh, dystonia of their vocal cords, where the uh, vocal cords come together and they have this kind of strange voice. Oh, they come apart. They have this kind of whispering voice. Uh, this is called spasmodic dysphonia. And there are at least two types of spasmodic dysphonia, uh, which is again an example of focal dystonia involving the larynx. Uh, so let's just focus on blepharospasm. Um, we define blepharospasm as involuntary, intermittent, or persistent, bilateral, possibly asymmetrical, and uh, many patients with blepharospasm start in one eye and then it spreads to the other eye and it remains asymmetrical, uh, but in most cases it's uh, bilateral involving both eyes. Uh, it's an eye closure with spasmodic contractions of the orbicularis oculi. Again, that's the muscle, and we're going to he hear a lot about orbicularis oculi during the course of, of the day. That's the main muscle that contracts uh, the eyelids. There are other muscles that are also involved with blepharospasm, including the eyebrow muscles. Uh, we call those procerus and corrugator muscles, and I'm sure you're going to hear about uh, those muscles later on. Uh, so the, the patients with blepharospasm often have uh, spasms of other parts of the face, uh, tongue, neck, uh, and that's why we use the term cranial. Cranial means head, cervical meaning neck, uh, dystonia. We talked about laryngeal dystonia, uh, uh, cervical dystonia, and many other parts of the body can be involved, including the whole body. Uh, sometimes uh, patients start with dystonia of the foot or dystonia of the hand, and it spreads uh, to involve the whole body. In fact, childhood onset dystonia often starts in the foot or in the hand. It becomes uh, more proximal, more generalized, and many children with uh, childhood onset dystonia become wheelchair-bound uh, by the time they reach adulthood. Uh, uh, there's a condition called DYT1 dystonia, which is the most common form of genetic dystonia, which can start in childhood and may also cause uh, blepharospasm. Many patients with blepharospasm start with increased frequency of blinking, and you're going to hear about photophobia later on, which means uh, sort of sensi sensitivity to light. Um, Dystonia can be painful, and uh, certainly blepharospasm can be painful. And uh, even though uh, many patients with blepharospasm are initially referred to an ophthalmologist because uh, they understandably think that this is an eye problem, uh, they don't really have an eye problem. It's, it's not a visual problem, even though the eye closure, of, of course, interferes with their vision, and some of them become essentially blind because of uh, the constant contraction of the eyelids uh, obscuring their, their vision. But uh, again, uh, blepharospasm is really not a true ophthalmological problem. It's a neurological uh, problem which does not interfere with vision, but nevertheless uh, can act uh, interfere with activities of daily living, watching TV, driving, reading, and so on. Uh, there are a number uh, of uh, things that exacerbate the trigger blepharospasm, such as bright light, wind, and movement. You're going to hear more about that. Uh, patients uh, with blepharospasm, uh, when they uh, concentrate or look down, uh, they notice that the blepharospasm can uh, uh, actually imp uh, improve. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we often tell patients when they go to movies uh, that they should be sitting way up so they can look down on the screen as opposed to being on the, on the bottom and looking up because uh, that enables them to keep their eyes open. Uh, it is worse at rest uh, and while looking up. Uh, is really by dark glasses. I see a lot of uh, dark glasses uh, in the audience, 
and it is relieved by what we refer to as alleviating maneuvers. <clears throat> Sometimes it's also referred to as sensory tricks or just antagonist. Uh, these are uh, terms that we use for these various sensory tricks that I'm sure many of you have uh, noticed, like pulling on the upper eyelid, touching the forehead, uh, pinching the neck, humming, coughing, yawning, talking, singing. And I'll show you an example uh, later uh, of a patient who uses these maneuvers. Um, the progression may be uh, fairly r rapid, uh, but it usually takes several months or years uh, before the patient stabilizes. So when I see a patient uh, within the first few days or weeks or months after the onset of blepharospasm, I, I cannot always predict uh, how far they're going to progress. Uh, f five years later, I can probably tell them it's not going to get much worse. So the progression usually occurs uh, during the first few um, months or years, but uh, eventually the condition tends to stabilize and rarely continues to progress. Uh, unfortunately, remissions are rare. I have frankly never seen a patient with what I refer to as idiopathic blepharospasm going into remission and getting spontaneously better without any treatment. I wish I could uh, uh, say otherwise, but uh, blepharospasm usually is a persistent condition. Because it fluctuates and it is often related to stress, um, it often reads, uh, leads to misdiagnosis of psychogenic. Many of you probably have been told that this is all in your head, or this is uh, all related to stress, um, yet uh, uh, psychogenic blepharospasm is actually relatively uncommon. Having said that, uh, we occasionally do see patients uh, who have psychogenic blepharospasm that is clearly related to stress, but that is uh, the exception rather than the rule. So th this is taken from a paper that I co-authored with uh, Dr. Hallett and one of my fellows uh, looking at uh, some of the sensory aspects of movement disorders. We think of movement disorders as a motor disorder but there are lots of sensory issues related to uh, movement disorders, including pain and a variety of other factors. So, and here we want to focus on uh, this uh, notion of alleviating maneuver or sensory trick. Uh, so, for example, in the, here in the panel A, you see a patient who is trying to open the right eye by um, uh, uh, forcefully opening the, the left eye, contracting this uh, muscle called the frontalis muscle. Here's a patient, uh, the same patient, uh, touching the, the forehead. Uh, and uh, here's a patient using uh, these glasses, yellow tinted glasses, uh, uh, to help him uh, keep the eyes open. So uh, lots and lots of tricks that people uh, use. Uh, here's a patient who has blepharospasm and also cervical neck dystonia. And uh, again, he's using a variety of tricks like touching uh, um, uh, the chin or pulling on the fore uh, forehead in order to keep the eyes open. So let me, let me show you, if I could have the sound on this uh, patient, I'm going to show you an example of a patient with a blepharospasm and how she's using her tricks uh, to keep the eyes open. My eyes, they will, they will not stay open. Okay. And they want to squeeze sometimes. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't see. How long do you have symptoms? Oh, this is going, getting close to three years. Okay. Can you hold them open? If I see. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Do you drive? Mm-hmm. If I sing. Okay. Can you go and sing to see what happens? One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Just give me the strength to do every day so what see, I have to do. While she's singing, she's keeping, able to keep her eyes open. Um, so many of you find that when you talk, when you sing, when you hum, uh, you can keep your eyes open. It's uh, referred to as a sensory trick. I just want to show you some examples of uh, patients you know, with other kinds of blepharospasm. I have hundreds of hours of videos here, but I can show you only a few minutes. Uh, uh, so here's a patient with just pure blepharospasm. Here's a patient with blepharospasm and oral lingual dystonia, the dystonia of the tongue, so the tongue you know, protrudes uh, uh, in addition to the spasm. And here's an example of a patient with cranial cervical dystonia manifested by the blepharospasm, uh, jaw closure with the clenching of the jaws and the cervical dystonia, uh, turning of the head to the right and shoulder elevation. So many patients start with blepharospasm and as the condition progresses, they may develop oromandibular dystonia, meaning dystonia of the lower face, jaw, and tongue. Uh, some of them also then evolve into cervical dystonia, meaning dystonia of the neck. 
Some also have the spasmodic dystonia that I mentioned before, the laryngeal dystonia. And then there are some patients uh, who also uh, overlap with tremor. They may have tremor, tremor of the neck or they have tremor in the hands. So uh, I use this diagram to illustrate uh, that uh, there is often an overlap between the different forms of, of dystonia. Uh, and many patients um, uh, in my practice have all, all of these features blepharospasm, ornamental dystonia, cervical dystonia, spasmodic dystonia, and tremor. I'm sure many of you, you in the audience identify with this diagram because uh, many of you have all of these features. There are many other uh, involuntary eyelid contractions. Uh, there's a condition called reflex blepharospasm, which is sometimes seen in newborn infants. Uh, people after, after stroke uh, have blepharospasm only when uh, a light is uh, uh, shown in, in their eyes. Uh, there are lots of conditions, metabolic conditions, that have this reflex blepharospasm. We talked about dystonia. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, blepharospasm as the main feature, but there are many other conditions that can cause dystonia besides uh, just the, what we call primary dystonia, dystonia that uh, is not due to any specific cause, including tardive dystonia. Uh, tardive dystonia uh, is a condition that uh, uh, looks like just like blood spasm and cranial dystonia that I just described, but it is due to certain drugs, uh, particularly drugs that block dopamine receptors. So these drugs are sometimes used as psych psychiatric drugs uh, for treatment of schizophrenia and other uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, and uh, there are drugs uh, that are used for nausea and other gastrointestinal problems that also block uh, dopamine receptors. And these drugs uh, can cause a condition like blepharospasm, like uh, cranial cervical dystonia, uh, re referred to as tardive dystonia. If I have time, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, and there are many other conditions in which blepharospasm can occur, and I just listed some of them. Let me show you an example of uh, somebody with blinking who could have been perhaps misdiagnosed as having blepharospasm, but in this uh, girl, uh, she has Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is another neurologic condition that can affect the eyes or eyelids and can cause blinking, and in some cases even blepharospasm. Here's a patient with tardive dystonia, um, if I didn't tell you that she was treated with neuroleptic drugs, uh, these dopamine receptor blocking drugs, you wouldn't know the difference. She uh, clearly has blepharospasm, she has uh, spasms of the lower face and neck, uh, so she has cranial cervical dystonia, but in her case, this is due to exposure to uh, these drugs. I just want to show you uh, an example uh, how we sometimes treat tardive dystonia. So this patient was treated with a, con a medication called tetrabenazine, and you can see that her spasm uh, essentially completely resolved. Uh, tetrabenazine is one of the drugs that we use in the treatment of tardive uh, dystonia um, and other tardive conditions. So we probably will not have time to talk about this later on unless uh, somebody has some questions about it. Now, another condition that is often confused with blepharospasm is apraxia of eyelid opening. So let me show you an example uh, here in this case. So this patient, uh, uh, she, when she tries to open the eyes, as you can see, she's contracting her frontalis muscle, this, these muscles here in the forehead, trying to desperately open her eyes, and she has trouble doing that. Uh, this condition is different from blepharospasm, although it may be combined with blepharospasm. So it's called apraxia of eyelid opening, um, and uh, many patients who claim that they don't respond to Bashom toxin uh, probably have apraxia of eyelid opening. Uh, it's a very important condition to recognize, uh, and uh, neurologists uh, are uh, trained to differentiate it from, uh, from blepharospasm. Uh, there's a long history about this condition called apraxia valid opening. It was first described by Goldstein and Gogan in 1985, where they say that this was uh, a non paralytic motor abnormality where patients are unable to initiate the act of lid elevation. And there uh, are many uh, discussions among the experts as to what is the mechanism of this condition of apraxia of eyelid opening. Maybe Dr. Hallett is going to talk about it in, in his presentation. Um, but um, uh, basically, the, uh, the condition is manifested by inability to open the eyes. So once the eyes are closed, they cannot open the eyes. Uh, when I give a talk on botulinum toxin after the break, I'll show you an example of a patient uh, with apraxia of eyelid opening. Uh, so, uh, again, there's a controversy as to uh, the relationship between apraxia of eyelid opening and 
blood flow spasm. In this particular study, the first study, uh, one third of the cases the, that DeFazio and others uh, uh, reported uh, had coexistence of blood flow spasm in the proxy valid opening. Um, it's a relatively rare condition, and uh, the most recent study suggested that only 4% of patients had a combination of blood flow spasm and eyelid opening. I tend to agree more with this latter assessment. Uh, uh, many patients uh, th that I see are um, often uh, misdiagnosed by somebody who has a brachial eyelid opening, but they really just have blood flow spasm. But having said that, there are some patients who clearly do have both blood flow spasm and apraxia of eyelid opening. There are some patients who don't have blood flow spasm, they just have apraxia of eyelid opening. Uh, so um, those two conditions are probably separate and they probably have a uh, separate uh, different uh, mechanism. I just want to mention another condition that is often misdiagnosed as blood spasm and it's hemifacial spasm. Uh, so let me show you an example. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one of uh, uh, my patients that came from China and I'll, as I point out later, the, this condition is more common in Asian population. Uh, so uh, she uh, has the twitching of the left side of the face with closure of the eye, um, and uh, again, that's uh, uh, it's a very uh, common condition actually, especially in the Asian population. Um, can I say how many of you have actually hemifacial spasm here? Um, Okay, uh, so the, the, there is some representation, and uh, Dr. Sikula is going to talk about it later on this afternoon. So this is her husband, who didn't come as a patient, he just accompanied his wife, and you can see that he also has a facial spasm. Um, and, you know, when I asked him, I said, well, what about your spasm? He said, oh, I had this all my life, or, you know, he just didn't pay much attention to it, um, because it's, you know, so, so common. So um, when you go to Asia and sit at the airport, you may want to... Uh, look at uh, the people and see how many times you can diagnose hemifacial spasm. Um, this is from a study that we p published a few years ago where we um, uh, tried to uh, address uh, whether uh, hemifacial spasm is indeed more common in the Asian population and clearly showed uh, that in contrast to, let's say, cervical dystonia, uh, that uh, Asian population is much more overrepresented uh, in uh, the group with hemifacial spasm compared to, let's say, cervical dystonia. Um, and we thought that uh, it was like at least three times more common in Asian population than the Caucasian population. Um, uh, and uh, um, now Dr. Sikola is going to talk more about hemifacial spasm, but I just want to show you an example of, of a scan of one of our patients showing this abnormal blood vessel uh, that is probably compressing the facial nerve, which is by far the most common cause of hemifacial spasm. Um, in, in this study, uh, uh, we looked at 215 patients who were referred to us with uh, the diagnosis of hemifacial spasm, clearly found that uh, uh, primary or idiopathic hemifacial spasm, presumably due to compression of the facial nerve by uh, uh, a blood vessel, uh, uh, represented about 62% of all the cases, uh, and uh, some cases had other reasons. Some were even hereditary, and we reported uh, several families where hemifacial spasm uh, was part of a uh, genetic uh, condition. Sometimes it follows Bell's palsy, uh, facial nerve injury, demyelination, occasionally uh, even brain tumors. Um, can cause hemifacial spasm and a variety of other uh, conditions uh, can, can do it. Again, many patients with hemifacial spasm are initially misdiagnosed as being psychogenic or uh, that this is just due to stress. So uh, in this series of, of patients, uh, the majority of them had this idiopathic uh, hemifacial spasm probably due to vascular compression of the facial nerve. Uh, some of them are familiar, Bell's palsy, those are some of the most common causes. Sometimes we see it in multiple sclerosis uh, and uh, other conditions. One of the ways that we can differentiate hemifacial spasm from blepharospasm is uh, by looking uh, for what is referred to as other Babinski sign. Babinski, Joseph Babinski was one of the most famous neurologists. He described a, a sign called Babinski sign that every neurologist uh, learns about in the first day of neurology. Um, and it's the, one of the most important signs in neurology. Uh, but uh, Joseph Babinski uh, also described this other sign that I want to describe for you uh, uh, in a minute. Um, and we, that's why we call it the other Babinski sign. And basically what uh, 
uh, he uh, was talking about is that patients with hemifacial spasm, like for example this woman, uh, she has a contraction of the left side of her face, and you can see that she has elevation of the eyebrow on the, the same side of the hemifacial spasm. Here's another example, patient with hemifacial spasm, elevation of the eyebrow. Here's a patient on the right side of the face, elevation of the eyebrow, another example. So um, uh, patients with hemifacial spasm, they have elevation of the eyebrow each time they have a contraction, as opposed to patients with blepharospasm who have depression of the eyebrow. The eyebrow goes down during the spasm. So this is just one of the ways that neurologists uh, uh, differentiate between blepharospasm and hemifacial spasm. So let me, let me show you some, some examples. This is from uh, this publication that I just referred to. Here's, uh, again, the other Babinski sign. You can see that his right eyebrow always elevates as he contracts uh, the right side of the face. Here's a patient who has hemifacial spasm on both sides, and this is actually a genetic condition. She has a strong family history, so several members of her family have it. And then a Bell's palsy is another condition that can cause hemifacial spasm. You can see that every time he tries to elevate um, uh, the, uh, uh, or to contract one side of the face on the right side of the face, uh, the, all the other muscles on that side of the face uh, also contract. And that's called uh, that's after Bell's palsy. And here's an example of somebody with psychogenic hemifacial spasm um, due to a variety of stresses. Um, so occasionally, hemifacial spasm can actually occur uh, in uh, patients uh, with uh, due to stress. Here's another example. Um, this is called myokymia, uh, where there's this contraction of the facial muscles, sort of an undulating type contraction of the facial muscle. This is sometimes seen in patients who have multiple sclerosis or have brainstem tumor. Um, so when we see that, uh, even though they may not be disabling to the patient or even embarrassing, for us this is an important sign because we have to look for evidence of any kind of uh, damage uh, to the brainstem. Uh, so it's called myokymia. Uh, there are other people who have uh, spasms of right side of the face. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually seems to be quite common. Um, so how, how do we treat uh, hemifacial spasm? Uh, again, uh, Dr. Sikola is going to talk about the surgical treatment, and uh, many patients uh, undergo uh, decompression of the facial nerve. Uh, uh, it's uh, done by a very sophisticated type procedure that actually was innovated here in, in Pittsburgh by uh, Professor Peter Janetta, who is uh, one of Dr. Sikula's uh, mentors. So I'm sure the, Dr. Sikula is going to talk about it. But um, uh, medications like carbamazepine, clonazepam, baclofen have been tried. They are usually ineffective. We rarely ever use those anymore. And we actually use botulinum toxin that I'm going to talk about later as uh, the main treatment for hemifacial spasm. Almost all patients respond very well if it's done appropriately. Uh, rarely some patients have the droopiness of the uh, eyelid or facial asymmetry after the injection, but uh, that can be easily managed, particularly if we inject uh, muscles uh, away from the lid, lip. So many times, uh, especially novel, novices in the injections, they tend to inject uh, close, to the eye, uh, close to the lip, and that almost always causes asymmetry of uh, the facial expression and uh, asymmetry in the smile, so we stay away from the, from the uh, upper lip. Um, so overall, it's usually a well-tolerated procedure. So I'm going to stop here. I think I finished on time, um, but I'll come back after break and talk about um, botulinum toxin, which is uh, considered to be the treatment of choice for patients with blepharospasm as well as hemifacial spasm. And I, thank you very much.